ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the month of Ramadan is close upon us. And as usual at that time of the year, we began hearing and rehearing the same ayat and a hadith that we have heard since we were children about the importance of Ramadan, about the importance of fasting, about the blessings of this month. And even though we have heard these hadith and these ayat so many times, yet still, Every time Ramadan comes, it is a refresher, it is a reminder. And Allah tells us in the Quran, وَذَكِّرْ فَإِنَّ الذِّكْرَ تَنْفَعُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Remind them for reminding benefits the believers. My dear brothers and sisters, know that the obligation to fast the month of Ramadan is an obligation that was revealed in the very first year of the Hijrah. The very first year after the Prophet ﷺ migrated to Medina. And the commandment to fast Ramadan occurs in the very first chapter, in the very first juz of the very first surah of the Quran, and that is Surah Al-Baqarah. Surah Al-Baqarah, the very first juz, by the way, is a very amazing juz. And of course it is, the whole Quran is amazing. But especially this juz, it tells us so much. It tells us about the story of the beginning. It divides people into Muslim and Kafir and Munafiq. It commands people to pray. It commands people to give charity. It commands people to fast. It commands people to go for Hajj. All of these commandments occur in the very first surah, in the very first juz of the Quran. And so the commandment to fast is a very early commandment in the Quran. It occurs in the very first juz. Allah says in the Quran, O you who believe, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, kutiba alaykum siyam Fasting has been legislated for you. Meaning it's a done deal. Even before Allah revealed it, it had been ordained. It is something that is pre-eternal. Allah had already decided fasting would be obligated upon you. Then Allah tells us, you're not the only group that has fasted. كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ just like fasting has been ordained for all nations before you. They have abandoned it, they have modified it. To this day, yes, it is true that some of the remnants of the Jews and Christians, they have their versions of fasting. It is true, they have their Lents and they have their, 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 their various holy days, but we are the only tradition that has maintained and fulfilled the actual fast that Allah has legislated. But the concept of fasting goes back to the other generations as well. Then Allah gives us the wisdom of fasting. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you can attain the taqwa of Allah. And the taqwa, there's no one way to translate it, but the primary translation is the consciousness of Allah. God consciousness. So Allah tells us the purpose of fasting is to attain taqwa. And wallahi, there is no other deed that we can do that helps in attaining taqwa like the fast. Look at our prayers. Let us be very honest with ourselves. For those of us that do pray five times a day, the fact of the matter is that by and large, those prayers have become routine. They have become monotonous. It's simply, you look at the time, oh, it's time to pray. You pray, and while you're bowing up and down, your mind is on the latest business transaction. Your mind is on what you're going to do next. Your mind is on picking up your kids. Your mind might even be on the latest scores and whatnot of the football match or whatnot. This is the reality of our salah. When it comes to zakat, it's just one, two checks, and then you're done. When it comes to hajj, it's not a regular thing, once in a lifetime for those who are able to do it. <coughs> so what is the one deed that really gets us into the spirit of fasting, of, uh, of ibadah. It is fasting. 
What is the one deed that genuinely brings about a consciousness of Allah? It is the fasting. In the month of Ramadan, what happens? Even the most farthest Muslim from Islam rediscovers his Islam. Even the one who doesn't pray, who is involved in major sins, in this month, something in his heart rekindles. Something comes out. In this month, the Muslim who never comes to the masjid, we see him in the masjid. In this month, each and every one of us, we began monitoring our day and our night. We began monitoring our speech. We began monitoring our eyes. We began monitoring what we're doing. We even began monitoring where we are, if it's an evil place. Oh, I'm fasting, I can't be here. This is consciousness, this is taqwa. This is exactly what taqwa is. And the act of fasting brings about that taqwa. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Never in the whole year do we monitor our talk as we do in the month of Ramadan. Our eyes as we do in the month of Ramadan. Literally, the whole month becomes a month of monitoring Allah. And therefore doesn't what Allah say make sense? I have legislated fasting for you in order that you may attain this consciousness of Allah. لَعَلَّكُمْ <laughs> تَتَّقُونَ Then Allah says, أَيَّامًا مَعْدُودَاتِ it's only a limited number of days. Ayyaman ma'dudat. And this is so true. When Ramadan begins, we think, oh my God, 30 days, how am I going to fast it? Subhanallah. One week goes by, we're like, subhanallah, one week gone by. Then 10 days, then 15 days. Then before you know it, you're in the last 10 days. And then that's it, Eid. And then it becomes a memory of the past. Like so many Ramadans that have gone by. Ayyaman ma'dudat. Limited number of days. Meaning, it's a golden opportunity. Allah is stressing. You only have a limited time frame. You know when there's a sale going on, the marketplace <coughs> says what? Limited time only. Because they want you to take advantage of it. If you don't do it now, you're not going to get the sale. How about when Allah Azza is offering Jannah for you for a price that is affordable? This is the sale of Ramadan. When Jannah itself becomes easy for you. This is exactly what our Prophet said. In the month of Ramadan, when the Ramadan moon is seen, our Prophet ﷺ said, the shayateen are chained up. So your number one enemy is out of the picture. The doors of Jahannam are shut. You couldn't go there even if you tried, they're shut. The doors of Jannah are flung open. There's only one way to go. This is in the month of Ramadan. So literally the opportunities of Ramadan are never there. That's why Allah says, Ayaman ma'dudat. Limited number of days. You can count them down. 29, 28, 27. It's a, it's a countdown. Ayaman ma'dudat. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that famous verse in the Quran that links Ramadan with the Quran. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. Now this is amazing for many reasons. First and foremost, the only month that is mentioned by Allah in the whole Qur'an is Ramadan. Allah does not mention any other month by name. The only name that is mentioned in the Qur'an of the months of the year is the month of Ramadan. And Allah says, Shahru Ramadan, the month of Ramadan. To emphasize its sanctity, its holiness. Shahru Ramadan, alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. This is the month when the Qur'an came down. Now, another important message of these series of verses is often overlooked. The association of Qur'an with Ramadan is more explicit than the association of Siyam with Ramadan. I repeat, pay attention to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly links together Ramadan with the Qur'an before Allah links Ramadan with Siyam. Unfortunately, many of us, we skip over this. We don't pay its due attention. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzil fihi al-Qur'an. Then afterwards, Allah says, if you're there, then fast. If you're not traveling, then fast. That's part two. Part one links Qur'an and Ramadan. Ramadan is the month not of fasting, that's part two. Section two, Ramadan is the month of fasting. Section one, Ramadan is the month of the Qur'an. 
شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن. Ibn Abbas he commented on this and he said that in the month of Ramadan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the entire Quran from the Lawh al-Mahfuz, from the highest book, the preserved tablet. Allah revealed it to the lowest heavens. How, where, what, beyond our knowledge. But the whole Quran came down in the month of Ramadan. And Ibn Abbas said, it was stored or housed at a place called the House of Honor, Baytul Izza. So there is a place up in our heavens, it is called the House of Honor. In that House of Honor, there is housed the original Quran from the Lawh al-Mahfuz. Allah sent it down in the month of Ramadan. Then, on the very first day of revelation, which some scholars say is the day after Laylatul Qadr, <coughs> i.e. the day after the night of Laylatul Qadr, Jibreel alayhi salam came down to Ghar Hira and revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Iqra. So Iqra was revealed in one of the odd days of the days of Ramadan. Many of us don't know this fact. Iqra, the revelation began the night after Laylatul Qadr, when our Prophet was sitting in Ghar Iraq. So the entire Quran came down in Ramadan, and then the revelation began in the last 10 days of Ramadan. <coughs> and why? Because Allah wanted to link Ramadan with the Quran. So Ramadan is the month of the Quran. It has always been the month of the Quran. And that is why from the very beginning, our Prophet ﷺ established the sunnah of reading the whole Quran in Ramadan. Authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha that, Oh Aisha, every year Jibreel came to me to read the Quran to me and I read the Quran back to him. There was a two-way going on here. The Prophet ﷺ is reading Quran to Jibreel. Jibreel is reading Quran to him. This year, he insisted that I read it twice. So I have a premonition this might be my last year. And it was his last year. <coughs> it was his last year. The point being that the sunnah of reading the Quran in the whole month of Ramadan is established by the Prophet himself and Jibreel. Two great role models, the best of humans and the best of angels are reading and listening to each other. So they're establishing for us the precedent. We should read and we should listen. We should read ourselves. Now the way the Ummah has done this, and there's nothing wrong with this, is very good. The way the Ummah has done this, they've taken this and they've put this Sunnah in the Salat al-Taraweeh. So in Salat al-Taraweeh, the Imam recites the whole Quran and we, we should all know the Prophet himself did not begin the whole Quran in Taraweeh because he didn't that wasn't possible for him. He only let the rabbi three times. And then he wasn't able to do it more than this. But later on, the Sahaba, they began to institute the sunnah of reciting the whole Quran in the rabbi. And there's nothing wrong with this at all. It is a healthy sunnah. And it's good that we recite the whole Quran in the But along with reciting the Quran, we should also be reading it ourselves. Just like the Prophet would read and listen. So just like listening to the Qur'an is one sunnah in Ramadan, so too reciting the Qur'an is a sunnah as well. شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ This is a description of the Qur'an. Guidance for mankind. Clarifying between good and evil. So whoever witnesses the month amongst you, then let him fast it. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مَنْ كُشَرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ Here is the command, you must fast Ramadan. As I said, fasting is... Number two. Number one, Quran. Number two, fasting. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you're sick, if you're not able to, let him make up in another time. This is of the mercy of the Sharia. Ah. If you're not able to fast, if you're traveling, if you're sick, if our sisters are in their cycle, they're, they're, they're delivered, uh, any person who is elderly, they all have options to get out of it. And alhamdulillah, our Sharia ah is not going to uh, put burden on somebody beyond they can bear. And then Allah says, and this is a, a, a beautiful uh, verse that Allah Azza wa Jalla says that from al kanamin kum maridan aw ala safna fa'idun min al-ukhr wa wa ala ladhi yutiqun fidyan ta'am miskin. Whoever is not able to, they can give the fidya. Yuridu Allahu bikum al-yusra, wa la yuridu bikum al-usr. Allah wants to make things easy for you, and He does not want to make things difficult for you. 
Now it is truly profound that this phrase occurs in the passage about fasting Ramadan. Allah wants to make things easy for you. He does not want to make things difficult for you. Why is this amazing? Why is this profound? Because every one of us, come the month of Ramadan, one side of us begins to start feeling nervous. We start feeling tense. How am I going to fast? So many hours. These days it's the summer months as well. So for some of us, how many? 18, 19 hours for some of you in this part of the world. For us in America, it's 15, 16 hours uh, these days. For you guys, it'll be even more uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. So we began to wonder, how am I going to do it? Outside of Ramadan, if we don't eat our lunch, if we don't have our tea or coffee, we get headaches, we feel dizzy. And we began to wonder, how am I going to manage? But then Allah tells us within these series of verses, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ Allah wants to make things easy for you. He does not want to make things difficult for you. It is because of this verse and the blessings of Allah, my dear brothers and sisters, that all of us in this room who have fasted the previous years, we know the reality of Ramadan. That amazingly, miraculously, it is a miracle, we manage to fast without food, without water, without our caffeine, without our lunch in these summer months. And we don't even feel it, it's a breeze. And when we break our fast, we're like, oh my God, 18, 20 hours went by. It's so easy, why don't I do this every day of the year? That's how we feel. Until it becomes such a routine, it doesn't even feel like there's any problem going on. And we know for a fact that if we were to not have our meal for any other day outside of Ramadan, we would not function normally. But in Ramadan, something miraculous happens. يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ when we sacrifice for the sake of Allah, when we take the initiative, when we demonstrate to Allah, I'm not going to eat and drink because of your, your pleasure, O oh Allah. Allah will feed us and give us drink without even us knowing it. How. Allah will take care of those senses inside of us. And we don't need, we don't have the urge. And if we were to do this outside, it wouldn't work. So Allah is telling us, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ and so that you may finish the prescribed amount of time. In the beginning, Allah says, Ayam al Ma'dudat. In the end, Walitukmilul Both of them are demonstrating its limited number of times. It's a countdown. 30, 29, 28, 27. Tick, finish up the prescribed number of time. And so that you may praise Allah for having guided you. And so that you may thank Him. These verses of Surah Al-Baqarah are the primary verses that talk about the fasting of Ramadan. And in them is much benefit and wisdom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who ponder these verses, understand them, and act appropriately upon them. Barakallahu وَرَكُمْ فَقْرًا عَظِيمٌ وَنَفَعَنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِمَا فِيهِمْ الْآيَاتِ وَذِكْرِ الْحَكِيمِ أَقُولُ مَا تَسْمَعُونَ وَأَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهَ عَظِيمًا لِي وَلَكُمْ وَلِسَاءِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ كُلِّ ذَنْبٍ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ الحمد لله الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعده. In the first half of my khutbah, I talked about the most important verses pertaining to fasting. There are many ahadith about fasting, and time does not permit me to go into all of them. But in the second half, I just want to mention perhaps the most famous hadith about fasting. So that we can shed some light about some wisdoms in that hadith, just like we shed some light in the first part of the khutbah about some wisdoms of the most famous verse of the Quran. Perhaps the most famous hadith of fasting is a hadith that is muttafaq alay. Muttafaq alay means Bukhari and Muslim, which means it is the most authentic. And it is hadith Qudsi. And hadith Qudsi means it is the Prophet وسلم, telling us what Allah said. So the highest authenticity of hadith is muttafaq alayh and the highest nobility of hadith is hadith qudsi and the number of a hadith that are both qudsi and muttafaq alayh are very few you can count them maybe not on the fingers of one hand but you can count the very few a hadith 
This hadith of fasting is one of them. That is both muttafaq alayh, it's the highest level of authenticity, and it is hadith qudsi. And hadith qudsi is the highest category of hadith in terms of nobility, in terms of sharaf. Why? Because the Prophet is saying, Allah said. It's basically not quite the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is separate, but it is of the same genus as the Qur'an, because the Qur'an is the kalamullah. And the Hadith Qudsi is another type of Kalamullah, it is also Kalamullah. And therefore, out of all of the Ahadith, Hadith Qudsi is the highest category in terms of Sharaf. And Muttafaq Ali is the highest category in terms of authenticity. This Hadith combines the both of them. Narrated by Abu Huraira that the Prophet wasallam said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hadith Qudsi, that all of the actions of the son of Adam go back to him, except for one. And that is the Siyam. <clears throat> For the Siyam is mine, and only I shall reward it. Now, the hadith goes on, let me explain this hadith. All of the actions of the son of Adam go back to him. Now, in reality, all of our actions belong to Allah. Wallahu khalaqakum wa ma ta'amaloon. Allah owns us and Allah owns our actions. In reality, everything we do, we, of all of us, belong to Allah. But Allah is saying that the actions that you do for yourselves, you will be able to see the reward, you'll be able to judge it, you'll be able to make a hisab, a muqabala, a transaction. In another hadith, we learn that every single good deed of the son of Adam is rewarded between 10 to 700 times. Between 10 to 700 times. This is the meaning of the hadith that all of the actions of the son of Adam go back to him. So if you pay one pound in charity, Allah will reward you minimum 10 pounds. Minimum. He could reward you 100, 500, maximum 700. Why? Because your one pound is not the same as your brother's one pound. Your brother's one pound is not the same as your cousin's one pound. The ikhlas, the need of that one pound, the, 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 the circumstances change from person to person. So the same pound could be given minimum of 10, maximum of 700. The same goes for salah, the same goes for zakah. But there's a few deeds, just a few of them, that Allah says, this scale of 10 to 700, throw it out the window. It doesn't apply. The scale of 10 to 700 in just a few deeds doesn't apply. <coughs> Number one on the list is siyam. Siyam, how are you going to judge it? You can judge a pound. You can judge it. You can judge giving food to people. There's a commensurate. How are you going to judge siyam? On what level? On what scale? Allah Azza wa Jal will return the siyam to us in a manner that is beyond counting. We won't be able to see the, the hisab, to see the, the, the commensuration. The proportionality will not even be there. And this is the meaning of the hadith. That all of the deeds of the son of Adam, they will go back to him. He will see, oh, I did this, I got this back. I did this, I got this back. But there will be some deeds, he will not understand where these massive amounts of rewards are coming from. It doesn't make sense to him. And the top on the list is the siyam. Illa siyam. فَإِنَّهُ li. Allah says, that is mine. Now by ascribing the siyam to himself, this is a means of honoring the siyam, a means of raising it above all the other levels. Whenever Allah ascribes something to Himself, this is an ascription of honor. In Arabic, ilafa to tashrif, ascription of honor. So, for example, doesn't everything belong to Allah? Doesn't all houses belong to Allah? Of course. But when Allah says Baytullah, automatically there's one house we talk about. Not my house, not your house. When Allah says Baytullah, that's one house, that's the Kaaba. Even though all houses belong to Allah. But when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, this is my house, the Kaaba. So it raises the Kaaba to an infinitely higher level compared to anything else. The same goes for anything else Allah ascribes. For example, Abd, we are all Abdullah, we are all servants of Allah. But when Allah mentions in the Quran, Subhanallah asra bi abdihi. Or, وَلَمَّا قَامَ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ There is an Abdullah mentioned in the Qur'an. That Abdullah is our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Allah calls our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abdullah, Abduhu, 
Now that is idafa to tashrif. That Abdullah is not like me and you when we're saying we're all servants of Allah. No, 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 no. So similarly, the good deeds, all of them belong to Allah. But Allah says, you can all have them. I want one. So this is taking this good deed and raising it infinitely higher. And that's the concept of Siyam. إِلَّا الصَّوْمْ فَإِنَّهُ لِي وَأَنَا أَجْزِي بِهِ It is mine and I will reward it directly. So this gives us the good news that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself will take charge of giving us back the rewards of the fasting. And the reason for this, my dear brothers and sisters, is obvious. And that is because the fasting involves a type of worship that is the absence of doing something. The difficult thing of fasting, see when you pray, you do things. You bow down, you read. When you give zakah, you do things. When you fast, you don't do things. You stop doing what otherwise you are required to do to live. And that is to eat and drink. You stop doing the two most important mechanisms for you to live because Allah told you don't do it. That is the ultimate sacrifice. And that is why Allah says, that is mine, I shall reward it. And the hadith goes on, because he has left his pangs, he has left his hunger, he has left his thirst because of me. So Allah is boasting to the angels. Allah is proud of this meager thing that we have done. Because it genuinely shows a type of servitude. Allah says, don't eat and drink. We will not eat and drink. And the hadith goes on and on. Brothers and sisters, the, the, the benefits of Ramadan are so many. Of the benefits, by the way, that are derived, they're understood. Of the benefits of Ramadan is that in the month of Ramadan, we experience what it is like to actually feel hungry. For most of us, especially in the Western world, especially in this part of the world. We are not battling the problems that other people have to battle with. For most of us, we have a roof over our heads. For most of us, we have fridge and electricity and stoves and ovens. We have food to eat. For most of us, we could not even think of the last time where we didn't have access to food and we're wondering, how am I going to feed myself and my family? Allah has protected us, most of us, from that issue. So we have forgotten what it feels like to be hungry. So the month of Ramadan, we are forced to remind ourselves that you know what, not everybody is so fortunate. There are people out there that need to be taken care of. So we become one with the poor every single day. The month of Ramadan as well, it blesses us in that we appreciate what we take for granted. Wallahi, how much we take our food and water for granted. We don't even think. In the month of Ramadan, we have to stop. And when we don't have it, we're thirsty in the daytime, we realize, you know what, I take it for granted. So we thank Allah for what otherwise we wouldn't even think about. In the month of Ramadan, one of the things that happens is that the Muslim brotherhood goes to the highest level of the year. Because you see each other at the masjid, because there's invitations for, for breaking fast, because the Uhuwa comes up. And one of the, 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 the key elements of our ummah is to have that brotherhood. And in the month of Ramadan, that brotherhood is manifested. In the month of Ramadan, the houses of Allah are packed to capacity. And this is one of the greatest blessings of Ramadan. The houses of Allah are packed every single night. People are there. What a great blessing. And this month of Ramadan is a month of the Qur'an. We hear the Qur'an, we recite the Qur'an, it's recited in the Masajid. The globe over, the globe is reverberating with the tilawah of the Qur'an. From one side of the world to the other side. This is of the blessings of Ramadan. Of the blessings of Ramadan is that people are more taqwa, they're conscious of Allah. They're monitoring, as we said, their hearts, their minds, their thoughts, their eyes, their ears, their, their, their limbs of the blessings of Ramadan is that people become more charitable. It is the month of charity. It's supposed to be the month of charity. Of the blessings of Ramadan is that people make dua to Allah like they never made before or after. When, they, when Ramadan comes at the time of iftar especially, one of the most important times to make dua, people become more involved in dua. Of the blessings of Ramadan is that nafil is prayed, sunnah is prayed. Those who are struggling to pray five times a day, master the five times prayer. Those who are praying five times, they add on the sunnah. Those who are praying the sunnah, they make sure they go to taraweeh and nafil. Whatever one's level is, you increase that level. And therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, and with this point I conclude, the ultimate blessing of Ramadan, the ultimate blessing of Ramadan is that you show yourself 
that you know what? I can be a better Muslim. You demonstrate to yourself that you know I can be a better person. I can be a better worshiper of Allah. I can be a better servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know that sin that I thought I was addicted to? Guess what? I gave it up in Ramadan. You know I kept on giving excuses why I couldn't pray, I couldn't do the sunnah, I couldn't do... Guess what? Ramadan has demonstrated I can do it. So in Ramadan, if your level was zero, you go all the way up to mashallah tabarakallah 100. Now it's true when Ramadan is over, you're not going to stay at 100. It's human nature. But the goal is that when Ramadan finishes, you don't come crashing back down to zero again. No. Yeah, you're going to come down. It's only human. Ramadan is over. Come down 80, 90, 70, 60, 50 even. But the goal is when Ramadan finishes, you have in the end been raised from where you began. So that when the next Ramadan comes, you raise yourself even higher. Then when Ramadan finishes, okay, a little bit of a doubt, it's gonna happen. But when you finish, it's higher than when you began. So that every single Ramadan, you climb higher to Jannah. So that your best Ramadan is your last Ramadan. That's the goal, my dear brothers and sisters. That every year of your life you go higher and higher and higher and higher until finally when death comes to you, you're at your all-time high. That's our goal, my dear brothers and sisters. The problem comes, many of us were on the flat line. And that's our goal, astaghfirullah. We want to remain on the dead line. Sure, in Ramadan we'll take a big curve up there, but then we'll come crashing back down and then remain at that crash thinking our job has been done. No, the main goal of Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters, is to give us that, you know, every battery dies. Every battery needs to be recharged. That's what Ramadan is. It's that recharging of our Iman. It's that boost that every one of us needs. After the boost, Sure, you're not going to stay there. It's impossible to be outside of Ramadan as you are inside of Ramadan. That's not even the Sahaba could do that. But the goal is what? You have increased your level of worship. You've come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that it'll be that boost that you need until the next Ramadan and then over and over and over again until finally there is no more Ramadan. And that too is a fact, my dear brothers and sisters. There is everyone amongst you. Without a doubt, I swear by Allah, everyone amongst you and myself, we know of people who participated with us in last Ramadan and they are no longer here. Everyone sitting here knows family and friend. It is impossible that any one of you here is simply completely uh, innocent in this regard that there's no, but no, it is the reality of life and death. The strange thing, my dear brothers and sisters, is that we do not realize that one day it will be our family and friends thinking about us. Oh, you know, he used to be there last year, now he's no longer here. We don't know when that will be. For some it will be at younger age, for others it will be at a later age. But for all of us, there will be one Ramadan that will be our last Ramadan. We don't know, this might be that Ramadan. Let's make sure it is our best Ramadan. We give it our ultimate best, my dear brothers and sisters. And we need to do that from now. We need to do that from now, thinking about what we're going to do, having a reasonable schedule, taking care of matters that need to be taken care of from now, including such mundane issues such as Eid shopping. You don't want to go Eid shopping on the nights of Laylatul Qadr. Do it now for your kids, what you need to do. Do it now for your family. Why would you wait to the nights of Laylatul Qadr and then go and waste them over there? Take care of things. Think about what you need to do. Change your schedule around. When will you sleep? When will you wake up? Start putting that schedule in from now so that when Ramadan comes, you're already more alert. It's something that is human nature that you plan for what needs to be done. Your Quran. When will you be reading Quran? Think about it. Will it be after Fajr? Will it be on your way to work? How? Put it into your schedule. Where there's a will, there's a way. And from now, before Ramadan comes, put it into your mind. What am I going to do? What is going to be this and that? Do the shopping that you need for your house from now. So that if you don't need to go waste your time, then don't do it from now. So that Allah Azza wa Jal saves that time for you for the month of Ramadan. And therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, demonstrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you're worthy of the month and the month is worthy of you. I conclude by reminding you of that very scary hadith of the Prophet sallallahu where he was rising on the mimbar in the month of Ramadan, one step after another. And he said, Ameen, Ameen, Ameen. And then he told, turned around and he said to the Sahaba, do you know why I said Ameen? Jibreel came to me and he told me, Three things, one after the other, we only have time for the first one. The first thing he told me that, O oh Muhammad, may the one 
who is alive when Ramadan comes, but is not able to have his sins forgiven, may that one perish. Say Amin. So the Prophet said Amin. And then the Al Hadith goes on for two other things. Meaning, if you cannot manage to get your sins forgiven in Ramadan, if you can't get your act together in Ramadan, if you cannot become more pious in Ramadan, then the fact of the matter is, if there's no hope for you in Ramadan, there's no hope for you at all. That's the point of the hadith. If you don't even have that much iman, that you cannot get your act together in this one month, then there is no hope for you outside of the month. And that's the purpose of this hadith. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who benefit from this month and maximize from its benefit. Allahumma ni da'in fa'aminu. Allahumma la tada'na fi hadhi yawmi dhamman illa ghafarta. Wala hamman illa farrajta. Wala daynan illa qadayta. Wala maridan illa shafayta. Wala asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma aghfir lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman. Wala taj'a fi qulubina ghillan lilladhina amanu. Rabbana innaka raufur rahim. Allahumma a'izza al-islam wa al-muslimin. اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بالسوء فاشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم أمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملاكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكة يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك رسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإتاء القرب وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة